The first is things you need to know if you're gonna go through this or walk through this. From a process standpoint, just dealing with adoption agencies and the bureaucratic process of it, we did lose a few couples after that first day. They wanna make sure you're healthy, make sure you're not abusing drugs, not abusing alcohol. Prepare to wait. <laughs> This is a web of people. Sometimes it gets kind of frustrating to kind of, you know, figure out who do I talk to about this? Who do I talk to about this? All in all, everybody's trying to do their best for the child. Sometimes you don't understand why certain things are being done. Understand that you're stepping into another world where there's a system already at work. Hey guys, this is a little bit different. I'm not in my office today. I'm in my bedroom with my wife, uh, Cheryl. Thanks for being here. We're going to talk about our adoption process and the things we went through and things you should prepare for if you're going to be adopting. So uh, it's going to be a transparent conversation. So we're going to talk about a process of how we came to adopt and the decision process and then, you know, where we are today in that process. So, babe, can you start off with just telling us, you know, why we decided to do this or some of the conversations we had? Um, and how long this has really been in the works. It's because number one, I was adopted and I've always planned on adopting a child or children, depending on where I would be in life. Whether I was married or single, that's always been my plan because my parents did such an awesome job with me. I think I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and number two, we're also financially blessed. So we also want to just give back and help out another child. Why not? Yeah, we were married almost 19 years. Uh, next month makes 19 years. So, um, you know, even when we started dating, I knew that this was part of the part of the package. You know, we get here some at some point. Now, we also said that we would do it earlier on in life. You know, we said once our youngest child turned six. Yeah, about five or six. Five or six, we would do it. And he turned 11 and we were like, <laughs> hey, it's time to put up a shut up. You know, either we're going to do this or we're not. So. Um, we started the process. We're going to go through, um, there's actually two videos to this, and we're going to break this up into two conversations. The first is things you need to know if you're going to go through this or walk through this from a process standpoint, uh, just dealing with adoption agencies and the bureaucratic process of it. I worked in the government for 23 years, and I will tell you, the government has nothing on the entities or multiple entities that are in adoption. So we're going to talk through some things that you need to know if you're planning on adopting. Um, and we just want you to know this from our perspective. We're not adoption experts. We are now, you know, our child has been in our home for two and a half, two and a half months or so. You know, we're not experts in this process at all. We're walking this out and we're recording these videos as we walk this out. So, you know, you're going to get kind of play by play of what's going on and what we've experienced um, so far. So from a process standpoint, honey, mm -hmm. uh, what's the first thing that people need to be prepared for if they're going to go down this road? Okay. So the first thing to be prepared for in the adoption process is be prepared to have lots of training. We went through a company called Gladney. There's lots of adoption companies. Um, however, Gladney was the one that we found that you can actually do foster to adopt. So a lot of people want to do, you know, they want to adopt babies. That's a different process. Lots of companies out there for that. But as far as like a child that's already a little bit older, that's usually a foster to adopt process. So Gladney was the best company for us. We had to do, well, about what, two months? Yeah. About mm -hmm. two months in person at the Gladney Center. Very, it was a very good training. So lots of um, details on what to expect, kind of scare you straight right at the gate, letting you know, don't waste their time, don't waste a child's time um, because it's a very serious process. You're bringing a child into your home. And if you're not ready, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it because you don't want to have a child come in and then you can't handle it or whatever. And then you're sending them out and they're just, it's a continual process and they're in the system forever. So just really pray if that's your thing, and just really know that's what you want. You know, really talk to your spouse or talk to whoever it is in your life to know that this is a very, it's a lifetime process. Yeah, I remember the first day of training. So we thought we were like, okay, we're gonna do this, we're all in. We thought that. And then the first day of training, you know, they start telling us some things and walking through, you know, some things that you may experience. And keep in mind, you're adopting here. You don't usually adopt someone out of a wonderful, life situation. They will tell you like, you know, expect trauma, 
Uh, your child's <clears throat> going to come with a degree of baggage, uh, not trusting you. Uh, some of these children have been in multiple foster homes. People have lied to them, not kept promises and stuff like that. So they're not going to trust you initially. Um, you know, there's going to be abuse in their background um, and they're going to act out based on that abuse in their background. So, you know, that was day one. And they told us at the end of day one of training, they're like, hey, if you do not come back tomorrow, no hard feelings. It's cool. OK, so um, we did lose a few couples um, after that first day um, and lose a few people after that first day, because the reality is you need to be serious about this process. But you are going to be trained and prepared for what's going to come because you're going to deal with things that you may not be accustomed to dealing with, uh, especially when you start talking about, you know, uh, different types of abuse, different types of situations that these kids are facing in life starvation, um, neglect, um, you know, things that they've been exposed to. So, uh, but they train you to be able to deal with those things. And I, I, I mean, we were sitting in class and we said, you know what, if we had this training of just how to communicate with kids before we had our own kids, <laughs> we probably would have been better parents, honestly. Um, but you know, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was really good training, but you're going to get a lot of training and continuous training to prepare you. So the next thing that people should be prepared for, honey, if they're going to go down this track. So yeah, prepare for them to be intrusive. So in other words, once you're, um, accepted, once they approve you, um, there's a lot of interviews. There's a lot of coming into your home as far as like interviews together and inter interviews individually, um, interviews with the children. Um, you have to have, um, a lot of medical exams, they want to make sure you're healthy, um, make sure you're not abusing drugs, not abusing alcohol, pretty much anything. And then they ask you pretty much your childhood, how you were brought up. Do you believe in spankings or not? What type of punishment? So pretty much everything is like I said, like he said, it's very um, intrusive. Um, they want to know your finances. You have to turn in your tax statements, all of that stuff. Um, list all your, your budget out, household expenses, all the things. The interview process was very, you know, intrusive because, you know, they ask you stuff about your past, you know, things you've dealt with, uh, trauma in your background. Um, and by the way, I, I will say about the finances part, um, you know, they're not looking to see that you're wealthy or that you're rich or that you have a certain amount of income. That's not what they're looking for. I tell you people that, I mean, I mean, they're looking for really anybody to adopt. <laughs> um, so the reality is, you know, they're just looking to see that you're not destitute or something like that. And you actually can support another child coming into your home, um, which we'll talk about on the next video when we talk about, you know, things to expect from a family standpoint. So, mm -hmm. uh, but it is going to be a very <clears throat> intrusive process coming into your home. Uh, even if you're in foster care, sometimes there are visits that uh, or you're doing foster to adopt their visits that are just, you know, pop up visits, as they say, um, just to see how you're living your life and everything. How are things going that you haven't planned mm -hmm. for for a particular visit? OK, so back to the process part. Number one. Mm -hmm. um, so Gladney in particular has what's called a matching process mm -hmm. and their success rate is actually about 95 percent. So they've been pretty successful at matching. So they, they're not a company who just places any child in any home just to get rid of them per se, just to kind of, you know, get them out of the system. So, um, yeah, some people wait for a very long, long time. Some people like us, well, we were pretty blessed. I won't say lucky, but we were pretty blessed in that the first child that we were interested in. So once you're approved, they'll send you a child or so each month, just depending on when they become available. Mm -hmm. Some seasons are busier than others. For some reason, the summers there's a lot more children in the system around the holidays, stuff like that. During that time, it's a little bit, you know, busy. And the matching process is better for us as far as if you're really eager to get a child. So mm -hmm. for us, your specifics at first, you have to really state what you want. Be very specific about what type of child you want from race to age to whether you care about whether they're bisexual, all the stuff. You have to list pretty much everything. So for us, we wanted a little girl because we have all boys. So we wanted a little girl from the ages of six to 10 or 11. Um, we did end up with a teenager. Um, but that's just because we felt that's who was supposed to be with us. It was something about her. So that's why we ended up with her. But that's what I wanted to say about the matching process is very successful. 
Um, it's like an interview process to tell you about the child. And then they look at you. It's like the lawyer that shows up is the child's foster parents that they're currently with, their um, psychologist, their psychiatrist, their caseworker, and then our caseworker. So it's a lot of people to assess our interviews and our answers and whether they think we're a fit for that child. Yeah. And that's why it's very important to be uh, honest in the uh, in your interviews. There's really nothing to hide, yeah. um, you know. I mean, but it's important to be honest so that, you know, if you're going through an in, uh, to an organization that is matching, that they accurately match you with the right <clears throat> child. And granted, we're two months into this, but I think they did a fantastic job of matching us. Not to say that there are not challenges, um, but, you know, we did a fantastic job of matching us with a child that fits with our family, with our beliefs. It was a lot better because we were very transparent about what we were willing to accept and what we were not willing mm -hmm. uh, to accept. So number three is what's called the telling or that's when you receive the case file. So at this point, you have been approved. You know which child you're getting. Everybody's good to go. So you get what's called the telling. OK, depending on how many siblings this child has, how many foster homes they've been in, how long they've been in the system. That depends on how thick. <laughs> How many pages you're going to have to read in the file. So our file is about 3,500 pages. Not bad, but a little bit bad because we were in a rushed process, which we'll get into later as to why we were in a rushed process. But the telling tells you everything that the child has endured in every single foster home, everything that their bio parents, grandparents, everybody, just every single thing that they've endured throughout their life mm -hmm. um, is in that file. So you really get to know the child and if that child is a fit for your family. If you go through this process, understand that you get that file and it's a negative biased file. Um, it, it tells you basically everything bad about the child and everything bad about what someone has said about the child, things that they've experienced, things they've been through. They don't tell you the great things about the child necessarily. Sometimes, it's just uh, yeah. sometimes, but for the most part, it's a negatively biased uh, report. Um, which, so if you know that you have to view it with a grain of salt, like there are some things that we read and you have to be able to extract from yourself. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to, you have to view like you're a cloud, like you're looking at it, you know, from an overarching, you know, perspective. Um, you know, in my family, we study the Bible all the time. And I always tell them that, look, Matthew, Mark, Luke is like pay, play by play of what's happening in the life of Jesus. But John is kind of an overarching, you know, view. And sometimes you'll read something, you know, about what happened to the child or something the child did, but then you're like, oh, well, that correlates with this. And that's why they're acting out there mm -hmm. because this is going on there. You know, of, of course they're depressed. They've got this situation going on in their life and this situation. So that makes sense. So as you read it, you know, we, we would read things and be like, oh yeah, that makes sense because you know, this had just happened a month ago or this had just happened two weeks ago. But sometimes the people who are writing it are just writing the facts. Mm -hmm. This happened in school. This happened. The teacher said this. Um, so I would say take it with a grain of salt, but, you know, also pay attention to it mm -hmm. uh, because and you really have to have a degree of maturity to really straddle the fence. Just to piggyback off what Major was saying about the telling um, as far as like really combing through the file. So most times you're going to notice the worst behaviors happen when there's a transition, when they've just come into a new foster home, that's when you notice the grades are dropping, a lot more trouble, whatever areas they may have weaknesses in per se, mm -hmm. um, is heightened. So, and then you'll notice if they've been in the home for a while after about the third or fourth month, you know, it's back good again, like whoever they naturally are, you know, it comes out. So just take that into consideration. Transitional periods are usually the worst, which is like he said, it's a natural thing. It's understandable. You got to also prepare to be shocked. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, there are some things you're going to read in these documents like I, you're you're going to be like, I cannot believe an adult did this or this happened to this child. Um, you know, there are some things that you're going to read and it's going to be kind of it's going to be rather disturbing. Um, and, you know, it's going to hurt to read some of those uh, documents are in graphic detail. Mm -hmm. um, of certain things. Sometimes you watch a movie and you're like, hey, there's no way this happens in real life. And sometimes when you read these documents, you, you feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just got to be prepared for that. Yeah. And take into consideration um, your household. So we already have a 14 year old and we have a, well, he's now 12. So take into consideration 
all those factors when mm-hmm. you're reading the file too. So you want to still do what's best for the kids that God has blessed you with. You want to protect them before so falling in love and you know with the file and everything mm-hmm. and trying to say just make sure you make the best decision. So the fourth thing that you should be prepared for, honey. Prepare to wait. <laughs> Like hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. Um, I'll take that. I mean, there's some parts of this process that are extremely frustrating, and you're like, you're pushing and prodding, trying to get information. Like, okay, when are we doing this, and when are we doing this? Mm-hmm. And I will say that in our situation, when we were, like, when we were saying, hey, you know, this is the child that we're bringing in, we we're like, hey, let's let's freaking do it. Hurry up. Um, and you know, it, it became very frustrating for us. Because honestly, in some situations, people have already been through a lot and you want to minimize uh, the things that you have to deal with um, as a parent in helping this child move on to the next level of life. When when they start saying things like, hey, we're going to move them from this place to this place, and then you're going to complete your, your interviews and all that stuff and your meetings, there is a certain amount of meetings that you have to have before the child is placed in your home. Typically, you know, sometimes it's a foster to adopt you know, situation or emergency placement situation. Um, But when we were, um, and we actually got shifted to a foster to adopt situation, which is not something we planned, but there was just a a, kind of, they just did that as a uh, designation, you know, in order to uh, place the child in our home um, as a foster to adopt. So we had to do even more training. Yeah, because we wanted it faster. (laughs) Because we wanted, yeah, we wanted the child in our home. Mm -hmm. Um, But the waiting process is like, this person has to talk to this person and this has to be approved and the lawyers have to approve it and everything. So once you're approved, like I said, we have to meet with all the people that we just talked about, psychiatrist, psychologist, the lawyer, our caseworker, her caseworker, the school person, somebody else. There's a lot of people that's involved in the process um, just to make sure the match is appropriate and everything. Talk about the process of when they find out because they don't find out immediately. There's stuff going on in the background. Yeah. They're in their foster homes and all that stuff. They're just going through life. Um, our child was a little bit older. Mm-hmm. So um, in our situation, you know, it's interesting because they get to an age, I think it's about 13, where they can decide whether they want to be adopted or not. Um, they could kind of age out of the system, uh, stay in foster care or whatever until they turn 18 and move on. They have to they have to say, hey, yes, I still want to be adopted. Understand that when you're going through this process, there's a lot of people that talk to other people and approval processes and bureaucratic processes that I frankly got very frustrated with. Um, and I may or may not have sent some very direct emails uh, to some people. <laughs> But, you know, uh, understand that this is a process of waiting. And then sometimes when we first got it, we was like, hey, we want to move forward. This is a child that we're interested in. And then it was like over somebody was on vacation. Like, oh, yes, let's schedule this for three weeks from now. We'll have a Zoom meeting three weeks from now. I'm like, mm-hmm. well, that's stupid. I mean, uh, why are we waiting three weeks to have a Zoom meeting and get this process moving? So, mm-hmm. you know, there is a lot of, you know, you might get frustrated by some of the bureaucratic processes that are in place and seemingly people don't want to move as fast as you want to move. So once you complete all the um, paperwork and everything and you've been approved to actually adopt the child, there's like this profile, remember online? Yeah. The profile. That took us a long time um, to complete, mainly because vacation popped up in between, just life in general. So that part is what takes the longest. So if you can get that portion done and get that paperwork to them then things move faster but from that moment um, once they say okay we're good to go then you have your purposes of course like I said we wanted um, a little girl I don't know if I mentioned that we wanted a little girl African-American or someone mixed with African-American and them just so they can blend in with our family um, between the ages of six and ten and we wanted a female because we have all boys that particular age range is a little bit more difficult um, to get so for us it was a longer process just because I don't know if that age range is already placed because most times people get younger children or I don't know, <laughs> but it's a hard, it's a hard age range. The other part of it is, you know, it, everybody's process is different. Like you said, our, our age range was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Now we started out and we'll tell our story in the next video. We started out with a specific age range and 
Um, yeah, we wanted them in school. No babies. We wanted them in school a little bit younger. Just to be honest, yeah, just a little bit younger so that we could groom them per se. And they're not yeah. already have been through so much trauma. We so. had the Goldilocks theory. We did. <laughs> Not too hot, not too cold. Yeah. Just, yeah, this just, is just right there. 10 is just right. Mm -hmm. Our daughter's not 10. Okay. <laughs> um, she's a bit, a bit older mm -hmm. and a bit sassier. The last thing I want to talk about to be prepared for is you've touched on this a little bit, mm -hmm. but you got to be prepared to have there are multiple people involved in this process. I call it who's who in the zoo. We have a caseworker, our daughter has a caseworker. Uh, she has a psychologist and a psychiatrist and a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, she has a, there is a education. There's an education uh, coordinator. So when you start talking about things about school, sometimes they have to involve the educational mm -hmm. coordinator um, with certain things. She has siblings. So her siblings has, you know, um, is placed in a home. Mm -hmm. And then that mother uh, those parents have caseworkers mm -hmm. and everything. This is a web of people. Um, and sometimes it gets kind of frustrating to kind of, you know, figure out who do I talk to about this? Who do I talk to about this? Um, I would just say to lean on your caseworker a lot to figure out who makes certain decisions um, with, you know, what's going on with this situation. Okay. And it gets to be a process, especially with your, when you're in placement and adoption is not final and stuff like that, it can get very frustrating to figure out who who's the decision maker here. Um, that, that can be kind of frustrating. So um, any thoughts on that, honey, about who's who in the zoo and the multi multitude of people? So the process itself. So from the time we get her in the home, it's a six month process with Gladney until the adoption is final. But our adoption date is um, October 25th. She came in in May. No, March. Sorry, March 26th. So it's a six-month process with Gladney before it's fully final. Even though it's pretty much, we already know that's who we're going to get. That's our adoption child. But it's just a process of six months before it's officially final. Because I guess they want to protect us and the child in case something really happens or something. I'm not sure. But it is a six-month process. Yeah. So for six months, you're going to have caseworkers in and out of the home. But once it's final, it's final. But it is a process. You have to be patient with the process. Um, you know, understand that I, it, all in all, everybody's trying to do their best for the child. Sometimes you don't understand why certain things are being done, but understand that you're stepping into another world where there's a system already, you know, at work. Sometimes the system is bureaucratic and, you know, it, it, you hate the system. Um, Sometimes the system fails these kids. That's just the reality of it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. These caseworkers are, you know, overworked, significantly underpaid. And I'm like, this is absolutely insane to know the kids that you have to, you know, main train track of and everything. And, you know, I think we've done our best to kind of, you know, alleviate some stuff from our caseworker. It's like, you know, hey, you know, yeah. hey, we'll come to you. Don't worry about, you know, coming here if we can come to you. But, uh, but it is a process. So just understand that, you know, you're working with people who are doing their best for children and just give everybody a little bit of grace in this process. But um, if you want to reach out to us and ask us about, you know, uh, this process or this information, I am going to put Cheryl's email address up so you can email <laughs> Cheryl and ask her about this stuff. Um, because if you email me at my work email where I do mortgages, I'm just going to forward it to Cheryl um, <laughs> and she's going to ask. But um, but it is a, a very rewarding process. So uh, please reach out if you have any questions about this. Hope you enjoy this video um, and hope you learned something. Um, if something wasn't clear, just let us know. Any closing thoughts, honey? Nope. It's, it's worth it in the end. It's always good to help another child. So don't get frustrated because there is a process to mm -hmm. this. So you get to the happy point. So. Mm -hmm. And be sure to check out our other video where we talk about things you need to think about from a family perspective and preparing your family for this process. Yes. That's it. See you guys next time. Major Money Matters.